You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is James Corbett, editor of the CorbettReport.com and editorial writer for the International Forecaster. We'll speak to James right after this. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. James Corbett is speaking to us from Japan, where he has worked and lived since 2004. Welcome to the show, James. Always good to be with you. Thanks for having me back. It's interesting that U.S. Fed head Janet Yellen has said the U.S. economy depends on the health and success of the Chinese economy. I don't think we would hear that from Donald Trump. <laughs> no, I don't think we would, but it is an admission, I, I think, of the one, interconnectedness of the markets, and two, how really, I mean, when you look at the economy, it's structured so that the central banks are dictating what is happening in the economy, but the central banks themselves are hamstrung by what's happening in the manufacturing sector and in global trade. And of course, that for the last decade and a half has rested largely on the Chinese manufacturing base of the world. And since that started to slow down, the ability of the Fed to do things like do four rate hikes this year, as they were originally projecting they were going to do, uh, have to be put to the side. So now they're saying, well, maybe we'll only do two uh, rate hikes. So China uh, and the Chinese manufacturing sector and global trade generally is dictating what the Fed does, and the Fed is dictating what happens in the economy. Negative interest rates, the effect they've seen in Switzerland is a 25% increase in the price of real estate. Since you don't make any money in the bank, maybe you can make it buying real estate. Any effect like that in Japan yet from their negative interest rate? I haven't seen any real estate knock-on effect uh, happening here, although one can imagine that will be coming. But certainly it is starting to, I think, affect the uh, the investment choices of people here. As again, they're trying to look for anything that will give them some sort of return on investment. So it's definitely going to encourage more people into the stock market here and into other uh, speculative investments, corporate bonds and the like. And uh, I think that's that's obviously part of the plan. But whether or not that results in any actual economic productivity uh, is, well, yet to be seen, although the early results so far have indicated all quite poorly. Uh, Japan manufacturing down uh, last month, uh, unemployment up. Uh, not a lot of the figures are looking particularly good for uh, the Japanese economy right now, and uh, certainly the negative interest rates don't seem to have spurred anything in particular. Well, in Europe, the banks, pension funds, and the insurance companies are struggling because of very low or negative interest rates. Exactly. And yes, of course, this is going to hurt the financial institutions first, and then that will be passed on to customers eventually. But at this point, it really is a penalty for the banks for, for having reserves, for parking them at the central bank. So uh, the only thing that they can do is try to lend to anyone and everyone. And we've seen how these types of enforced lending regimes work out. In fact, that it really is what caused the 1980s bubble here in Japan, was there were lending quotas that were set by the uh, the Bank of Japan for individual banks here, they had to lend a certain amount each month. So they just kept lending more and more and more. And people started using that money to invest in, in the real estate market, which started to balloon here. We got the bubble of the 1980s. And of course, eventually, once that popped and the central bank started trying to trying to unwind that, uh, that craziness, it just completely exploded. And we saw the last two decades, two and a half decades now of the stagnation in the Japanese economy. And it's very, I think we're following a similar path. Um, the best we could hope for is at this point some sort of two and a half decade long stagnation. But it's more likely, I think, to result in a catastrophic collapse because of the, the levels of household debt that, uh, that exist right now. Uh, have put people in an extremely precarious situation where they, well, a lot of people are already living month to month, and that's with overextended credit lines. That's something that we see all around the world. They say we're all one paycheck away from disaster. Do governments, when they bring out policies or central banks, consider things like that? Uh, I think, yes, of course they do. And we've seen that reflected, uh, at least partially, in such things as last year when the Federal Reserve was 
thinking about raising rates and whether or not they should. We saw that a couple of times last year during the FOMC press conferences where Yellen indicated that they were taking into account global the global uh, financial markets as part of their their calculus as to whether or not to raise rates. And of course, I think the most obvious example of that was last year when we saw the precipitous crash in Chinese stocks, which uh, which had a bit of a knock-on effect on markets around the world until the phony dead cat bounce uh, picked things up once again and uh, the Fed ended up raising rates anyway. But certainly those types of things do and and have to uh, play some part of the calculus in uh, in what the Fed and other uh, central banks do. And of course, there's the added effect that this year is a U.S. presidential election cycle, which is undoubtedly going to contribute to what the Fed does and how it does it. As I think if the Fed has any sort of interest in keeping a Democrat in the White House, then they would not want to raise rates too quickly this year and precipitate a contraction. One of the headlines on your website says, the global economy depends on one thing. What is that one thing? That one thing is the words of Janet Yellen, not the actions, not the theories, no, not, not any type of technology, not anything concrete, but the economy now hinges solely on the pronouncements of central bankers. And to some extent, we've seen this for decades now, and people, for example, used to refer to Greenspan as the wizard, and, you know, he would, if he said irrational exuberance, then the dot-com bubble bust and things like that. It, it, every single statement is parsed down to that level of adjectives, and what does that adjective mean, and what could it mean? Does that mean the Fed's going to start tightening, etc.? But I think the, the important point here is that this week, uh, Yellen was giving a speech at the Economic Club of New York, and I noticed just a deluge of headlines talking about, oh, it, Yellen might do this, therefore stocks, uh, European stocks are, are going down, or Yellen might do this, therefore oil futures are sliding, uh, Yellen might say this, therefore gold, uh, gold is easing. And uh, I saw so many headlines like that that it really struck me afresh just how much the global economy at this point hinges on the words of central bankers and, of course, the most important of the central bankers at this point, Janet Yellen. And that is not a sign of a healthy global economy or a stable global economy. That is a sign of an economy that is built on a house of cards that will come tumbling down at some point. So I was just trying to to point that out once again to uh, to people out there who who may not understand just how much all of this pers- uh, depends on perception rather than on anything concrete, any fundamentals in the market. If so much depends on Yellen, could it end up that she gets sued for bad advice or bad decisions? <laughs> Uh, that would be uh, not in this universe, we'll put it that way. Um, it's almost unthinkable. Uh, it, 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 interestingly enough, when you think about TPP and things like that, that enable companies to sue governments for policies that they enact that could potentially cut into those companies' profits, one wonders if they would attempt to try to sue Janet Yellen or someone like that who has power over the, the monetary fiscal policy of, of the United States. But... Then again, uh, the Fed often will hide behind the fact that it's not a part of government when it's convenient for them to say that, and they will pretend to be part of government when it's convenient for them to say that, because both of which are true. The Federal Reserve is both a government entity and something separate from government. So uh, one would imagine they would try to hide behind that to try to become immune from such prosecution. Yes, but as you know, lawyers know no ends when it comes to trying to finagle things in court. True. And I'm sure there are lawyers who would definitely attempt to do so. But I haven't seen that yet, and I don't think that's politically on the table at this point. What's the biggest pressure on the Japanese economy right now? Uh, there are so many different pressures. Um, but I think that just ultimately, it's a question of, of the ability of the, the Japanese government to not just be, be, maintain solvency, but to project Solvency. I think they're they're quite concerned with their ability to at least project the idea that they're not going to go under it at some point, which is why the consumer tax here uh, was a five percent tax that was raised to eight percent a year and a half or two years ago, as a sign that uh, the the Japan would be able to maintain its its crushing debt levels, and now they are thinking they were originally going to to raise that eight percent tax to a ten percent consumption tax uh, later this year, but they've delayed that until the beginning of 2017, and there are signs now that uh, Prime Minister Abe may delay that again, perhaps even off into 2018, uh, because the Japanese economy just can't uh, really support that level of, uh, of tax right now with retail sales dropping uh, at, on a month-to-month basis here. So uh, there's, there's definitely a 
contraction that is happening and people are not spending, people are not borrowing, and it seems to be a, cir a circle where people are spending less, therefore companies are cutting more, therefore people are spending less again. And uh, it, it's really a conundrum as to ha what they can do about this. And now that they've gone negative with the rates, there's really not that much left in the toolbox for the Bank of Japan to, to actually influence the markets. Well, apart from BC, which had a referendum on the value-added tax, uh, the HST, the harmonized tax with the federal government, we've never seen a rollback really in uh, state taxes. And now you take a look at England where the value-added tax there, it seems, increases every year. Uh, perhaps it's 20%. Yes. Uh, taxes very seldom tend to go down, uh, the GST being one of the few examples that I can think of. But uh, uh, ultimately, yes, when once governments try to, to claw a little bit money, more money from their, their, uh, their citizens, that generally doesn't tend to work in reverse when things are smooth sailing. So uh, these types of things are baked into the cake. And exactly as was predicted uh, here, uh, when the uh, the 5% tax jumped to an 8% tax, people predicted that retail sales would fall off the cliff after the 8% went in, and that's exactly what happened. There was a lot of front front loading of purchases uh, in the months leading up to the, the, the tax hike, and then after the tax hike, retail sales fell off the cliff and haven't really recovered since then. So there's no doubt that when, when and if they do jump from 8% to 10%, that will happen again. And there's also no doubt that the Japanese economy is already sputtering, so it would be a bad move. But again, Japan is kind of bound uh, to uh, into a corner where, painted into a corner where they have these crushing debt levels that they're trying to at least, pro again, project the idea that they can maintain. Yeah, you talked about front-end loading, and I remember that, where Japanese sales for cars and things like washing machines had jumped dramatically for about a three-month period. Yes, in fact, even my own household here, we were looking at uh, purchasing a, a fridge, so we decided to do it before the tax went up, of course. And I know when I visit London, what I look forward to is buying shoes and sports jackets for some reason. But with that 20% tax and the pound still being you know, pretty high compared to the Canadian dollar, I'm not tempted to make those purchases anymore. It's just too expensive. That's exactly it. It disincentivizes retail uh, purchases. And uh, of course, this is well known. This is basic economics 101. And uh, governments know this, but they, uh, they, they again, they've painted themselves into a corner where debt levels are now at the point where investors are going to start thinking and wondering about the ability of some of these governments to maintain those levels of debt. And again, it's about the perception more so than the reality. And as long as they can project that they have a stable tax base to support their debt levels, then uh, I think that's good enough for them. But when and if that really does choke up retail sales to the point where retail uh, is is uh, basically dying, I mean, that that's the point at which you're basically killing your country in order to save your tax base. We'll have more with James Corbett right after the break. Unbelievable harmony, spectacular performance, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel, Bird Dog, and the Vintage Electric Band coming to Mission White Rock, West Vancouver. Buy online and save at OnTourTickets.com. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with James Corbett. Takata, the maker of most of the airbags for most of the world's auto manufacturers, of course, faces a huge debt for the recalls involved. This went on for years and years. Shrapnel from those airbags when they deployed actually killed people. Now they're saying it will cost $24 billion for them to fix this problem and probably pay all the lawsuits that have resulted from it. What's that going to do to this company, and can it handle this kind of a lawsuit? It's probably also a very major uh, company in Japan. Uh, yes. Well, there's absolutely no way that this company could uh, support a $24 billion price, uh, price tag for this recall because their combined current assets are about $1.3 billion, and with, given their plunging share price, their market value is now $302 million. There's just absolutely no way that they could come up with the money to foot that bill, so it looks like bankruptcy. And it looks like Honda and Toyota 
have already said they're going to stop using Takata airbag inflators. So uh, they're already losing part of that, that market share that you were talking about. So it's uh, it looks like the end of the line for Takata. And uh, it's just another example of corporate um, mis- malfeasance coming out to, to bite them in the, the rear end after you know, however long this has been under the rug. Yes, and uh, of course, General Motors had a problem with their ignition switches with the keys falling out. So people didn't have power steering or power brakes. And they had accidents where people died, millions in lawsuits there. If that Japanese company goes out of business, there will be no one to sue, or can you go after the auto companies that actually made it or or use the product? I, I don't know about the, the intricacies of Japanese bankruptcy law. I would assume that there's some way to hold uh, some of the, res- the uh, executives responsible if if they can be you know, found guilty for, for criminal malfeasance. But I, I, again, I don't really know the, the specifics of the Japanese laws involved. But it is another example, uh, or potentially another example, of companies attempting to hide behind a restructuring or a bankruptcy to try to get out of prosecution. And a uh, perhaps more sobering example in recent years is uh, from Ira- Iraq, Afghanistan, where Blackwater, of course, was infamously involved with uh, several I- incidents involving the killing of civilians. And were never really prosecuted uh, for those events, especially because they restructured and hid behind name changes like Z and Academy and whatever else. And during that time, the, the U.S. State Department continued to hand them contracts, which complicated the prosecution. So there's a lot of the, these types of examples where companies a- attempt to reorganize, change their names, commit bank- or go into bankruptcy or what have you to try to avoid those types of criminal prosecution. The Trans-Pacific Partnership... TPP still wrapped in secrecy. What are some of the worst clauses in there that you've managed to dig up? Uh, the worst clauses are ones that predictably are uh, wrapped in such legalese that they become almost impenetrable. And I did write an article for the International Forecaster about this a few months ago when the text was first released. Three of the worst TPP clauses explained in plain English. And just to give your listeners a sense of that, uh, for example, from the investment chapter, chapter 9 of the TPP, article 9.18, uh, an example of legalese that says, if an investment dispute has not been resolved within six months of the receipt by the respondent of a written request for consultations pursuant to article 9.17.2 that the claimant has incurred loss or damage by reason of or arising out of that breach, and provided that a claimant may submit pursuant to subparagraph A1C or B1C a claim for etc., etc., if you re- if you manage to puzzle your way through that paragraph, what it is actually doing is establishing the Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanism, the ISDSM, which should be familiar to people. I hope people would be in, uh, uh, at least familiar with this concept. That is the concept by which a corporation can sue a government that implements policies, rules, or regulations that cut into their uh, their profit. And this is something, in fact, this is a standard bit of legalese that's been included in a number of different treaties uh, so far, and in fact, um, has already been baked into the cake in places like uh, Germany, where uh, Swedish energy major Vattenfall is suing the German government for $6 billion for their decision to uh, to uh, uh, eliminate nuclear power from the, the, the country. That's going to cut into Vattenfall's profits, so they are now suing the German government. So this already exists under something called the Convention on the Settlement of Investment Disputes between states and nationals of other states. But it's, of course, also being baked into the TPP cake uh, between the, uh, the Asian Pacific nations that signed on to the TPP. Uh, other examples in here, there's inter- intellectual property provisions that... Uh, that threaten uh, the Internet as we know it in some ways, uh, depending how these laws are enforced and whether they are enforced in the way that they could be under the, the legalese. It could uh, it could interfere with uh, the, the DMCA laws, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act laws in the U.S. that provide, quote-unquote, safe, har- safe harbor to Internet service providers that respond to copyright uh, copyright holders' requests for takedown. As long as the, the ISP is seen to respond to that, then they are given safe harbor under this U.S. law. But that could be undermined by this new TPP clause that could basically mean ISPs have to turn into proactive copyright cops and actively start policing everything that is posted to the, the Internet through their services to make sure that it in, in advance that it doesn't breach copyright. And of course, that brings with it all, all types of potentials for uh, copyright abuse and taking things down that would be uh, uh, fair use. Um, 
And uh, there's there's other things. There's about uh, food safety standards being lowered to the lowest common denominator, uh, including the basically the allowance of GMOs into countries like Japan that hitherto have had very strict controls over GMO food imports. So it's uh, it's lose 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 in a lot of ways, and those are just a few of the examples that have been culled from the text that has been released. And uh, I know when it comes to threatening, one of the reasons why Indonesia allows children, babies, two-year-olds to smoke cigarettes is that the tobacco companies have threatened to sue them for lowering their profits if they put in tobacco restrictions. These types of lawsuits have been filed. They there are examples of them all around the world. And as I say, this is being this is really being sewn into the fabric of a lot of these trade deals, which is another reason why these trade deals are so so ominous and why they generally only benefit the large corporations at the expense of everyone else. Is there any way to stop the TPP from being ratified and going through? Uh, it could be. It still can be stopped uh, in any number of the countries that are currently going through a ratification process. I don't think that's very likely, given what I've seen. Uh, I don't think there, there certainly is and has been protest in various countries about it, but I haven't seen a lot of political uh, movement on that. So um, we'll have to remain, that remains to be seen. Perhaps the U.S. might actually uh, be one of the, the real contesting grounds here uh, because they still have to, to ratify the treaty. So it could, it could still be stopped. Uh, it doesn't look like Trudeau is going to stop it in Canada, but uh, it could be stopped somewhere along the line. Well, I was going to say a uh, Republican Senate and Congress doesn't want to go along with anything that was proposed by a uh, Democrat administration like Obama. That's it. I mean, there is the political calculus, especially in an election year, which I think will uh, we've seen it play a little bit into the, the presidential uh, debates. And we have seen some of the candidates coming out in, in uh, against TPP. Uh, we've seen Hillary Clinton trying to run on both. The TPP, the TPP, I used to think was great, but now I, I think otherwise. And so trying to cover both sides of the, the field there. So it's definitely a political issue. I don't think it's a central defining political issue, but it has at least been raised. So there is at least the potential that it could still be um, refused to be ratified in the Senate. And I could see something like that being tied up in the courts for so long that a generation could pass and you wouldn't even know it was there. I think the worst clauses of this and some of the things we're talking about here with the investor state dispute settlement mechanism and other parts of that, that certainly takes time to get those kinds of legal precedents into the system. And there has to be a few, you know, high profile cases that are litigated out to completion and might go all the way to the Supreme Court or, or something along those lines. So it, it generally does take time for that to be established. But once the precedent is there, then the, the floodgates are open. So it, it's not it's all going to happen all at once, but it is at least, it's the wedge that can open the door to a lot of these issues. And I think the biggest concern people have is that environmental rules, regulations, and laws could be violated or ignored if they harm a company's profits. And of course, I think it's cheaper to ignore the environment, isn't it? It always is. Uh, it's, of course, one of the excluded factors in a lot of uh, uh, economic calculations. So it is always easier to ignore those types of things. Um, and as I say, I mean, this affects everything all the way to uh, food imports and other things that people think are fairly uh, important to them. Uh, and this will open the door to companies either suing if they think the restrictions are too tight or simply having uh, various food import and other types of import restrictions declared illegal because they are not quote unquote based on science or scientific uh, precedent. So uh, again, the, the precautionary principle will get thrown to the wayside in all of this. James, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Thank you again for having me on. My guest has been James Corbett, publisher of the CorbettReport.com and editorial writer for the International Forecaster. He was speaking to us from Japan, where he has worked and lived since 2004. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Comments or questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.